Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. This is our first episode that we've recorded since the show has gone live. So botulism episode and Tox 101 is out in the world. Mm -hmm. And I first of all want to thank everybody who took the time to listen to our episode. Seriously. Yeah. This is so wild and still feels very surreal to me. Yeah. And what we were telling ourselves with the first episode is like, this is the first pancake. The first pancake is always sacrificial and it only gets better after you get warmed up. So thank you for all of your feedback, both positive and constructive. We really appreciate it. I can't say how much we appreciate the feedback that we've gotten so far. Arsenic is going to drop later this week. Obviously, you're listening to this in like March, but as we're recording, (laughs) arsenic is getting ready to drop and I am so excited. I'm just so excited to see where this takes off. I am having so much fun recording. I want to do some, you know, some more social media for us. And so I've been taking a very theatrical approach to this Mm -hmm. and I'm letting my inner drama nerd just live her best life. So (laughs) if anyone listening is on social media actively right now on TikTok, I'm going to be doing some acting challenges. I'm going to release a couple of little short story, short pieces, and then I'd love to see what other people come up with and what costumes they can create for these characters, their interpretations. One of our valued patrons who subscribed after hearing our first episode, he is one of my dear TikTok friends, Jamie Bear, is also helping us with some social media stuff. And I can't wait to see how that turns out. So thank you, Jamie Bear. Yeah, shout out to Jamie Bear. And shout out to everybody who has so far subscribed to our Patreon. That's really helpful. Thank you to everybody who's followed us on YouTube because we have a YouTube as well. Yeah, and... You know, thank you. Just thank you, everybody, for for subscribing and sharing and rating. It's I can't say enough how helpful it is and how amazing this has been so far. Yeah. So yeah, I'm humbled and thank you. Take all of our feels. <laughs> all right. Now that all of the light stuff is out of the way, we're gonna get into the heaviness of this episode. Venus, you asked me to research this one specifically. Why did you want me to look into the rainbow herbicides and Agent Orange to begin with? So I heard of Agent Orange, it's been probably over a decade ago now, Mm -hmm. and I was playing the video game Rock Band, (laughs) because that's what... I was into at that time in my life no shame. and and I was playing the song Orange Crush by R.E.M. It's a banger great song and my mom comes in and she asks me do you know what this song is about and I said the soda yeah that's what I thought honestly yeah, yeah. and at this point in my life I did listen to music very lyrically and feeling the music but with this one I I really didn't know Mm -hmm. and she told me that it was about Agent Orange Mm -hmm. and that it was a chemical used in the Vietnam War and she didn't know much more as far as how it was used and why it was used but what she did know is that a few people in her life were affected by it oh shit Yeah, so the first example she gave me was her father, my grandfather. He was a master sergeant in the Air Force, and he served in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And in Vietnam, they used this Agent Orange, and she had heard of it, but not much more than that. And then in his mid-60s, his health started declining. Mm -hmm. He had some friends who had reached out to the VA, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they were very concerned because they had some very serious health issues going on, and there was some talk on the streets 
that Agent Orange could be to blame. As far as she knew, my grandfather never personally looked for benefits and dealt with that. After he retired and moved back to the States, after serving, he was pretty much done and yeah. didn't talk about his time there. But in his mid-60s, he got pancreatic cancer and passed very quickly after his diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And one of my understandings is, is that different cancers could be the result of Agent Orange. Yeah, definitely. So did your grandfather directly handle Agent Orange? I'm not 100% sure, mm -hmm. but I believe that during that time he was... He wasn't a master sergeant yet, but he was a higher ranking member of the Air Force. So I don't know if he would have personally handled it, but he definitely was on the ground and in the air in sure. Vietnam. So sure. whether he applied it himself or not, it was definitely around. So the second example that she gave me was her boss at the county. My mother worked at the county's assessor's office and the county assessor was a very nice gentleman who also served in the Air Force. And he, a few years, about five years into my mother knowing him, he started having some health problems and then he got a diagnosis of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. My mom made sure to note to me that he was not a smoker. He was not somebody who used illicit drugs mm -hmm. like you know these things that we kind of associate with lung cancer and of course we all know there are cases of lung cancer who from people who don't smoke or mm -hmm. don't use drugs but right. it's definitely more common but once he got his diagnosis he only survived for nine more months and then he succumbed to the illness as well and so both my grandfather and this man the county assessor they both passed in their mid-60s. They were both in the Air Force. They both were around Agent Orange. And then my mom was in a relationship with a man for a few years who was, was a, younger than my grandfather and her boss, but he was in the Army. So okay. he didn't personally mention any stories to her about mm -hmm. being around H and Orange, mm -hmm. but he, I believe, is the one that told her that that's what the R.E.M. song Orange Crush was about. Mm -hmm. So nothing with him. As far as I know, he's still alive and well. So it sounds to me like it was definitely something that was more used by the Air Force, but yeah. Just hearing these stories from my mom, I really wanted to know more about it. I mean, and it's something that we don't talk about a lot. Yeah. So let me ask, was your mom born before or after your grandfather served? She was born before he served in Vietnam. Okay. He, okay. he was already a serviceman. She was actually born in Okinawa, Japan, and didn't even come back to the States until she was 19, I believe. Okay. So he was already serving, but Vietnam had not happened yet. All right. Yeah, that's, I mean, those all sound, the people I've talked to who know people who are impacted by Agent Orange, these all sound like very typical similar stories. The Air Force definitely was one of the more impacted branches because they did mm -hmm. handle it directly, but the Army, you know, there were service people who were in the jungle after Agent Orange was sprayed and they got um, it on their skin, they breathed it in. The Navy was one of the later branches to become involved in the suits against the government and against Dow oh. Chemical and Monsanto because they weren't included initially. But then they were like, the Navy was a part of the spring. The Navy was a part of the storage. I mean, it's basically everybody was impacted if they were there. If they were in the area, they were impacted. But the Air Force, really, those were the guys who were in direct contact. Got the brunt of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So I guess let's get into some of the meat of it. What is this Agent Orange? What does it do? What is it? What is Agent Orange? Agent Orange is a chemical defoliant, which is just another way to say it's an herbicide, but it's a way to say that it's an herbicide used in warfare as a defoliant. And mm. so it is more sinister than just an herbicide, but its intentions were to kill plants. It's made of two specific chemicals, 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, which is how we'll be referring to them when we talk about them because they just have really long names. 2,4-D stands for 2,4-dichlorofenoxyacetic acid, so let's save time. And these chemicals were being researched at the beginning of the 20th century to help improve agriculture. So although they did end up having a sinister history, initially they were just to help mankind, to help our agriculture okay. and get rid of weeds in our fields. Got it. 
Okay. And so you mentioned the term herbicide mm-hmm. is is that different i mean i i inherently think it's different than a pesticide just because of the name but mm-hmm. could you clarify the big differences between the two sure so herbicides are meant to just kill plants they're meant to kill herbs and pesticides usually are intended to kill animals sometimes they're intended to kill bugs but pesticide can be extended to say rodents you'd use a pesticide on rats Mm, mm -hmm. and then insecticide is usually more specific for insects and bugs so Mm. pesticides herbicides insecticides they can be different but they can also they can cross over so with agent orange even though it's an herbicide we will see that there was damage to the fauna of the jungles and so With pesticides and insecticides, the idea is that it's going to kill the intruder, so to speak. It's going to kill the insects, it's going to kill the animals, but maintain the life of the plant itself. Yeah, and vice versa, it should be that if you're using something in agriculture, it shouldn't hurt the the plants that you're not intending to kill, it shouldn't hurt the animals around whatever farms they were initially used on, and it shouldn't hurt people. And so- Maybe that's why chemical defoliant is a better term, but technically it was just researched as an herbicide early on. Okay. And so what makes Agent Orange so dangerous? The danger from Agent Orange is not necessarily 2,4-D or 2,4-5-T. The jury is kind of out on whether or not they're dangerous. I have seen LD50 values for 2,4-D. I have seen some independent studies that showed that 2,4-D isn't inherently dangerous, but the part that made Agent Orange dangerous was in the manufacture of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, a chemical contaminant was produced called dioxins. And dioxins are some of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. They're super poisonous. So what, what are dioxins for us lay people? Dioxins are a group of toxic chemicals that have been linked to heart disease, liver disease, human reproductive disorders, and developmental issues. The main dioxin that has just the central structure for dioxins is TCDD, which stands for 2378-tetrachlorodibenzopedioxin. And you can have a couple different dioxins that are produced. So in different batches of Agent Orange, they saw different dioxins, but they're all dangerous. They're all very dangerous. It's considered highly toxic because it only takes 0.6 micrograms per kilogram of body weight to kill male guinea pigs. That's significant. However, they have found that there's a pretty major difference between the species. And so to kill a rabbit, it actually takes 500 times more. And to kill people, it's uncertain how much it would take. Were there any human tests done? There's no human tests. All we have are, there was Vietnam, and so we've tested the blood from soldiers in Vietnam. There was an explosion in 1976 in Italy at a plant that released dioxins into the air, and so they tested the blood of children in the area. And so, just for comparison, I said it takes 0.6 micrograms per kilogram to kill a guinea pig. And botulinum toxin, we only needed... 0.8 0.8 to 0.9 micrograms total for a 150 pound individual. So even though it could be a fairly small number, it's, you know, more than botulinum toxin, which we've already established is the most toxic thing on the planet, but it's still intense using guinea pig numbers. That's so small. It's very small. Human numbers, however, for the children that were in Seveso, Italy after that explosion, the average child had 2.5 micrograms per kilogram of body weight. The maximum amount they found in children was 8.4 micrograms per kilogram from the exposure. And none of these children actually died from exposure. So they didn't have any acute effects like death. I don't know about later on because I didn't go into a whole lot of detail researching this particular explosion and what happened to the children. We have information about what happens to Vietnam vets. So regardless of what their blood levels were at the time of exposure, they still experienced effects from dioxins that we know we can attribute to dioxin. Another interesting example that we could look at for the effects of dioxins and the amount of dioxins that can be present without killing somebody but still experiencing acute effects 
is that of Viktor Yushchenko, who people may remember was the former president of Ukraine. He was injured in what was probably an assassination attempt in 2004, where he was poisoned with dioxin. And oh. overnight, this man just it looked like he aged decades because of the effects of dioxin. One of the characteristic symptoms of dioxin poisoning is called chloracne. So it's this really, really bad, full-body cystic acne. And so oh, wow. this guy, he's still alive, but he's he's pockmarked and he's wrinkled. And this is what you see a lot with people who have direct acute exposure with dioxins. And there were several servicemen who complained of it. But they also complained of other things that were written off as combat stress. They had rashes that they called jungle rot. They had headache, dizziness, upset stomach. And so these are the immediate effects that they experienced. Got it. Mm -hmm. This is not down the road like when we were talking about the no. people that my mom knew, you know, decades in the future. This is right after. Oh, and cystic acne. Is that like when people watch that Dr. Pimple Popper and they pull uh, those big things out? Uh, Do you know what I'm uh, talking about? Probably. I don't know. I don't uh, watch that shit. I know. I, I've seen, I've people have tried to get me to watch it and I can't, but yeah. it's just like these huge cysts. Yeah, essentially. it's bad. I mean, the, the pictures I've seen look like just really, really bad blackheads is what I've seen pictures okay. of. But, I mean, it could vary from person to person depending on, you know, what your skin was like before you were exposed. But Do we have any more examples of dioxin exposure? Those are the main ones that I could think of. And we are technically exposed to dioxins just in everyday life, but at levels that aren't impacting us significantly. The incineration of some chemicals create dioxins, and that's actually how they're produced in 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. When they're mm. heated and when they're heated quickly, they end up producing dioxins. And so the incineration of other chemicals can produce it and release it into the atmosphere. The burning of cigarettes can release it into the atmosphere. And so you will see numbers that say that like Viktor Yushchenko had 600 times or whatever it was, the amount of dioxin normally found in blood at this point in the timeline of humanity. Wow, 600 times. Yeah, and, and you know, it's important to, to note that because he didn't die. He didn't die, and right. so- he survived. But who knows what he's going to be experiencing for the rest of his life. Do we know with that assassination attempt how the dioxin was administered? They think that he was at a dinner and somebody, probably somebody from the Ukraine or- yeah, a former Ukrainian official poisoned him. And dosed his food or drink with it. Specifically, because it looks like he was at a dinner with a bunch of other senior Ukrainian officials, and he was the one who was targeted. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Something interesting about that is that ingestion is different than what we're going to be covering mainly today with the Vietnam War. Kind of, because... Even though soldiers, they got it on their skin and they inhaled it, they were also drinking it because it would erode from the plants and into the water. I've seen accounts where American and Vietnamese soldiers were told it was safe as they were, you know, just dispersing it because they were wearing tanks on their back sometimes. It wasn't always by plane or by boat that oh. Agent Orange was being sprayed. Sometimes they had tanks on their back they were spraying like you might spray for pests in Weeds. your house. Yeah. 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 Or and, yeah. And so they, they would have these barrels that were left over from containing the agent and they would use the barrels as barbecue pits. They would store oh. drinking water in the old barrels. And so they had a lot of direct exposure and they had a lot of oral exposure from drinking water. Okay. I'm sorry. I have such a hard time with this because not only were they being exposed to these chemicals that were deadly to inhale, but then they're literally eating from where these chemicals were stored. Yes. They are combusting things. Like if you're turning it into a barbecue pit, any residue from that could combust. Yeah, and they didn't know. They didn't know because they told it was safe. Some of the servicemen that I've heard accounts from said that they thought they were spraying for mosquitoes. They thought it was an anti-malaria campaign that they were spraying for mosquitoes. And so that's how they were helping the local communities. They're helping. I'm helping you. Oh my gosh. Okay. Why did they call it Agent Orange and not, like, Agent Turquoise? They called it Agent Orange because the mixture, the specific mixture that was being sold by Dow Chemical and Monsanto came in 55-gallon drums that were marked with orange stripes. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
So were there any other pesticides and herbicides in the early 20th century that had harmful effects like Agent Orange? Or was this a one-off? There weren't necessarily the pesticides that released dioxins this way. This was definitely an interesting turn of events for human history, but none of the pesticides we really used early on were very good. I mean, there was the whole DDT thing. In 1962, around the same time that Agent Orange was being deployed in Vietnam, mm -hmm. Rachel Carson mm -hmm. released her book Silent Spring, which described in great detail the effects of DDT and how it killed birds and how it killed fish and how it was destroying the fauna of America because it was being used domestically and it was being used pretty intensely. There was videos of just trucks driving down the street and just spraying at midday, like at kids, you know, because kids aren't moving out of the way. Right. So we did have some pretty poor decisions with the herbicides and pesticides that we were using early on in the 20th century, but I don't think that there was anything quite like dioxins. And I mean, we were using Agent Orange domestically because we were using 2,4-D domestically and 2,4-5-T as well. And actually between 1945 and 1960, dom domestic use of 2,4-D rose from 917,000 pounds to 53 million pounds. So we were using quite a bit of it. Holy shit, that is a huge jump. Yes, yeah, so we were using a lot of it domestically. However, we were using different concentrations that they were using over in Vietnam because you're supposed to dilute it in order to be able to use it, and they weren't diluting it when they were using it in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's maybe why some of the long-lasting effects are being felt so much harder there Yes. than yeah. here. Got mm -hmm. it. Okay. I guess let's start moving towards the main thing that we're going to cover in this episode, which is Agent Orange being used in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So why was an herbicide being used for war? Initially, they wanted to use the herbicide in Japan, or they wanted to use an herbicide in Japan because they thought if they could destroy Japanese crops, that they could get some sort of a foothold in World War II against Japan. But mm. World War II ended before we ever got to use it. And I suppose that they, we did have the chance to use it in the Korean War, which was in 1950, shortly after World War II. But it did take time for us to decide to use it in Vietnam. We were in Vietnam for quite some time. And then in 1962, we started deploying the herbicides there. And it was actually part of a psychological warfare campaign. Oh, God. Was it that the defoliation would mess with their crops, it would mess with how they were able to hide in the wilderness. Because if yeah. I remember correctly, that was a big problem mm -hmm. that our servicemen had to overcome because in the States, we don't have these big lush forests that mm -hmm. are just deep with trees that you can't see through. So is that kind of what the idea was in the beginning? Yeah, well, and I mean, the Vietnamese soldiers, the North Vietnamese soldiers had home field advantage. They, they know this place. They were familiar with it. And so, yes, the reason that the government said we began using Agent Orange was to defoliate the jungle so that the Viet Cong didn't have anywhere to hide. Okay, I mean, I guess I could see how that makes sense. The Vietnam War is a very polarizing subject in America. There were a lot of movements that happened because of the Vietnam War. And in my opinion, growing up in American schools, I didn't have a lot of history given about the Vietnam War at all. So not only did I not get the whole picture, I barely got to even see a picture at all. Right. And maybe for some other people who are products of the lovely American school system, can we talk about objectively, why did we go to war with Vietnam? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I really understood it either because, again, I was educated in the same school system where we just sort of glossed over it. So the Vietnam War officially was fought between North Vietnam, which had the Viet Cong and the National Liberation Front, and they were communist, and then South Vietnam, which was the Republic of Vietnam. And this lasted from November 1st, 1955 to April 30th, 1975. Oh, wow. I had no idea. It was a long war. So when did America show up? So unfortunately, America was always there, but we only ramped up our boots on the ground presence for the last eight years. But America was always directly involved because after World War II, 
Vietnam was a French colony and we were trying to give aid to Vietnam in order to gain their independence. And so France Got started it. allowing Vietnam to have some independence and we started giving them economic aid. So we were always involved. And the reason that we got so thoroughly involved is because around the time of the Cold War, there was this communist party in Vietnam and the communist party was engaging in guerrilla warfare against the French. Guerrilla warfare meaning, I've heard the term, but I want to make sure that I understand it for the context of this episode. So it wasn't like the official army of Vietnam because the official government, you know, it wasn't being led by this guy Ho Chi Minh, actually, who Ho Chi Minh City mm -hmm. is named after. Got it. Okay. And so they were engaged in guerrilla warfare. And in 1954, they established a government in Hanoi, which is in far north Vietnam. A lot of the world, actually, because France was involved and mm -hmm. Indochina is Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And so mm -hmm. we were trying to get everything settled in Indochina and try to help them gain independence. But now they're trying to gain independence through communism, which, of course, the U.S. was not okay with. There were these Geneva Accords that ended the Indochina War on July 20th, 1954, to try to halt everything that was going on. Okay. But... We ended up dividing Vietnam at the 17th parallel, and so that's where North and South Vietnam came from, is we divided it. We decided that. Matt Stone and Trey Parker said it best with Team America, which is, we're coming to save the motherfucking day, yeah. <laughs> but really, we're actually coming to make everything worse and make the rules and mm -hmm. destruct mm -hmm. everything in our path. Basically. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. So they, they divided into North and South Vietnam. Yes. And North Vietnam was supported by the Soviet Union and China, who are also both communists. And then South Vietnam was supported by the United States, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, and Thailand. Oh, wow. I had no idea that there yeah. were so many countries involved in this war. I knew France yes. was involved. Mm -hmm. And then in 1960, there was a full civil war that erupted, and that's the official Vietnam War is as we recognize it. But it was also the second Indochina War. Got it. Okay. I want to make sure that I'm keeping up. So North Vietnam, communist, South Vietnam is republic. Like, Can we say that they were trying to go for democracy? I mean, we were trying to establish democracy. Just like we always try yeah. to bring, take mm -hmm. my democracy, take it. Even though this was a civil war between North and South Vietnam, because of our involvement between 1961 and 1973. Holy shit, I had no idea. That was 12 years. Yeah, our legacy there with the napalm and the herbicides and just being there, the Vietnamese actually refer to this as the American War. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can't even imagine. And so okay. that's that's why we were there is because we were essentially trying to stop the spread of communism as is one of America's favorite pastimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not laughing because this is a funny, but that is just, I've never heard it put that way and <laughs> hashtag accurate. Oh my god. Yeah. What are your favorite hobbies? <laughs> Baseball, apple pie, and stopping communism. Yeah. Okay. I, I really had no idea that we were going to war to help part mm -hmm. of Vietnam. In my head, it was Vietnam versus America, not part of Vietnam yeah. versus America. And we're helping the second part. I had no idea. So that helps a lot. Thank you. So the government decides that they want to defoliate. We're in uncharted territory. We don't know how to fight in the jungle. They have the home field advantage. Mm -hmm. So we are doing this to make things easier on the U.S. soldiers. Mm -hmm. But like you mentioned, there was also a psychological warfare effect. Mm -hmm. Can you go into more detail about the psychological warfare side of Agent Orange? Essentially, it was just that you would have planes fly overhead and they would spray the defoliant. And to anybody who's not educated as a chemist, this is weird. What is this going to do? I don't know what this is. Is it going to kill the mosquitoes? Is it going to kill people? You know, if you didn't see them fly overhead or if the defoliant just caught on the air and then came to wherever you were, it did kind of seem like magic. And so there was this psychological, racist, dehumanizing, like they're gonna think it's magic type thing, where they were like, we have the power, we can fly our planes, they'll maybe flee the area, the Viet Cong will, they'll flee the area. If they see the planes, they'll be confused about 
how the planes and the spraying does the damage. They'll be confused about how the chemical itself does the damage. Right, because I mean, these soldiers, that these Vietnamese soldiers, they don't know. Mm-hmm. L- let's assume that most of them don't know a thing or two about chemistry. Mm-hmm. I could see why they would think this is magic and freak them out. Yeah, and so they were trying to use that to be like, we have the advantage because we know what's going on and they don't. Because it's just, regardless of if, if they believe in magic or not, it's this mystery mist that is being sprayed on their jungles and killing everything. Let's talk about, in brief, because I know we're going to go into more detail, because my understanding is that most of the severe negative effects are Mm long-term. They're not something in the acute beginning stages. Right. But I do want to briefly talk about what are some of the effects on people, not the forest, not the jungles, not the crops. The long-term effects on people? Yeah, just in brief, before we get into the nitty-gritty. Exposure to Agent Orange for people who are actually there. So for the Vietnamese civilians, Vietnamese soldiers, and then American soldiers, it can cause several types of cancer. It can cause chronic lymphocytic leukemia, soft tissue sarcoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, respiratory cancer, testicular cancer was a pretty prevalent one, but it's also been linked to heart disease, diabetes, Parkinson's, ALS, and memory loss. So things that are pretty, I don't want to say every day, but I mean, pretty common Mm -hmm. health issues. Yes. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's so widespread that initially the VA was like, you can't say that you got that from Vietnam. There's no proof that that happened to you in Vietnam. Right. Because you could have heart disease because you ate nothing but hamburgers and steak Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. 30 years. I'll give the VA that on this one, but I'm coming for them later. Do we know if the impacts on the humans, all of these diseases, were they the actual intended use? Were we just saying we want to use this as a defoliant, but we actually do want to harm people? Or were the consequences unintended? I would say that the consequences were, I mean, of the two choices, I would say that they were unintended, but the better word is that they were just negligent. Got it. So the use of these gases was a violation of the 1925 Geneva Protocol on Chemical and Biological Warfare. And so the Kennedy administration had to separate itself from this by saying that the protocol wasn't interpreted to include plants. And so this wasn't a violation of any warfare agreements that the civilized world has. These are plants. This isn't going to affect the people. So you can't say. Yeah. If there were somehow proof that they were like, we're going to do this and just say that we're killing plants, but we're actually killing people, that would be a huge human rights violation. If that was their intention, they hid it very well. But considering how well they didn't hide everything else, I think that it was just negligence, that they did know it was dangerous and they decided to use it, but it was not the intended quote-unquote purpose. But it is worth saying that the 1925 protocol that they said that they weren't violating has actually been interpreted to include crop destruction, even though it's not explicitly named. So they still technically were in violation. Yeah, I mean, somebody somewhere knew this was bad. Well, Dow Chemical knew it was bad. And that's the company that made it. Mm -hmm. Let's say that... No one knew. No one in the government who decided we want to use Agent Orange as a defoliant. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that none of them knew that it would affect humans. Did they understand to what degree they were going to be poisoning the land? I don't think so. No, I don't think that there was any studies in soil or on plants of, there was no, I don't think there were any studies of that nature at that time. So I think that they genuinely didn't realize the long-term impacts that it would have. So we now know that it had effects on humans, intended or not. Mm-hmm. We've established that this was, in fact, a violation of these agreements and these conventions for warfare, even though some silver-tongued, sharp-witted lawyer, general, whatever, said, oh, no, actually, see, it's not because. Yeah. Now that we have a general understanding of Agent Orange, what I want to do now, if we can, I want to rewind and I want to take it step by step and dive into the details. Okay. So do the play by play. We are at war with and for Vietnam. What does the process of applying Agent Orange look like? 
for the most part, we had these modified C-123 planes that were supposed to be used for cargo, but they were modified so that they could be used to spray the chemical out of the plane from pretty low heights, so not too high above the canopy of the jungle, and it would usually be like five planes across doing it all at once. Okay. But they also had missions that would do it from boats on the river, and so that was when the Navy was involved, they would do it from boats on the river, and then they had people on foot who were spraying it. And this initial spray of Agent Orange was called Operation Ranch Hand because you're like spraying for weeds on the ranch, right? Oh my god. And the motto of Operation Ranch Hand was only you can stop a forest. Shut the fuck up. Not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. Overall, a portion of Vietnam the size of the state of Massachusetts has been contaminated with these herbicides. Jesus. Okay, so I had no idea that the Navy was involved. I only knew of the Air Force being involved. So you said that they were going and spraying it from the boat, so they're putting this directly into the water? I mean, essentially, yeah. That's the thing, too, is that nobody was thinking the Navy was involved, even though the Blue Water Navy was clearly involved in Operation Ranch Hand, but they didn't get any attention essentially from the VA for years because they were like the Navy wasn't involved and it was just Ugh. the Air Force that was a part of it it was maybe the Army was a part of it and so the Navy was kind of ignored wow when I was going through your initial research notes did mm -hmm. I see something about Vietnamese soldiers spraying this themselves or am I misremembering that yeah yeah they had South Vietnamese soldiers who were also spraying it and actually so they were obviously doing some shady shit. They being? The governments. Both governments. The United States Army had their planes flying over Vietnam with the insignia of South Vietnam. Oh, no. As to avoid some sort of warfare violation. And so the South Vietnamese thought that the planes flying overhead were South Vietnamese planes. They thought it was their country. And the planes would sometimes, because people were scared by these planes, they knew that there was a war going on, and they would see the mist, and they didn't know what it was. And so sometimes the planes would drop leaflets that said, essentially, don't be afraid. And they were in Vietnamese, and... We, the Americans, were dropping these leaflets? We were, but we were working... In tandem with South Vietnam to do this. Yeah. We would oh. drop these leaflets, and they had these comics with a character called Brother Nam. It showed the Viet Cong as just really dehumanized, and then it would show the U.S. government being like, we're safe, we're protecting Brother Nam, and you shouldn't be worried about the planes flying overhead, and you shouldn't be worried about the government agents with the tanks on their back who are spraying. And they even actually went so far, American soldiers and South Vietnamese soldiers would come into these villages where people were scared and they would do spot tests of the chemical on their own skin and say, look, it's safe. It's nothing to be worried about. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. That's beyond shady. Uh, yeah. I mean, that part- Evil. That part is intentionally lying. Yeah. That part, yeah, that part is- That is malicious. Yeah, yeah. That is malicious. I'm sorry. I am appalled that we essentially tricked. We oh, tricked- yeah. These South Vietnamese soldiers to think, like, this is going to help you when we know now, like, this is going to fuck up your country for decades. We knew we were destroying the jungle early on, but I don't think that we knew... The gravity of it. The gravity of it. But we did know that we were destroying the jungle. We knew that the portion of the country we were saying we were trying to protect was the portion of the country that we were destroying because it was these small villages we were trying to protect from communism that are being defoliated. It's those people that are still experiencing effects from dioxins. And so what did we really do to the people of North Vietnam or the government of North Vietnam? It was governments fighting each other and civilians paying the price. Yeah, this is very Team America, yeah. world police. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Okay. So before I just go on another rant, being angry at the government for the atrocities that they have imparted upon the world. So now we've sprayed it. We've had the planes spraying it overhead, mm -hmm. low flying over the canopies in the jungles. We have the 
Vietnamese and American soldiers spraying it on the ground. We have the Navy spraying it from the boats. How long does this process of spraying take? I don't think that the spraying takes very long because it would just be one flight over. I mean, they did go to areas repeatedly, but it should just take one flight okay. over, especially since we weren't diluting it, you know? Okay. So now that we've sprayed it, what were the initial impacts on the environment, the shores, the land, the forests, and then furthermore, the effects on the animal life? Right away, not the long term, right away, what do we see happening? So within 72 hours of spraying is when you would see the impact on the flora of the forest. And what 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T do, because those were the intended chemicals, mm -hmm. not the dioxins. So what they would do is they mimicked a growth hormone called auxin. It's actually a pretty specific herbicide that targets dicots, so broadleaf plants specifically, and it spares grasses. And 2,4-5-T oh. kills woody plants. So these were the two type of plants that should have very specifically been targeted. Okay. And these herbicides are hormonal growth dysregulators, and so they cause the plant leaves to grow uncontrollably and unsustainably until they fall off of the plant, and then the plant oh. has no leaves, and so the plant dies. Wow, because if the plant doesn't have anything to soak up the sun, to mm -hmm. photosynthesize, mm -hmm. then it doesn't know what the fuck to do, and so it just shrivels up and dies. Yes, yeah. Hi, I'm a crazy plant lady for anybody <laughs> who doesn't follow me on social media. I'm wondering, could you visibly see this growth happening? I don't know if you could actually watch it happen. Like, probably or was it on a cellular level? I think that it would actually cause the leaves to expand, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I don't yeah. think that it caused yeah. the cells to burst. I think the leaves would actually grow and then fall off. But the pictures okay. that I've seen of the jungles after being sprayed is they look like they've been decimated by a fire. Wow. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. And it, it kills the animals. And I don't know if that's the intense levels of undiluted herbicide that kills the animals or the dioxins. I would think it's probably the dioxins that killed the animals, but there would just be fish floating in the water, birds were dead, monkeys were dead. Most of the larger fauna did manage to leave, but I would assume that they had health effects that we just didn't see because we've, we've seen verified health effects in lab rats, and so I assume that the larger animals were also experiencing effects that have just gone undocumented. Well, well, yeah, because, I mean, why would we spend our time and money and energy on something yeah. that doesn't, ugh, okay. So the plants within three days die. Mm -hmm. What about with these soldiers? What are the soldiers feeling in those first few days? The soldiers who sprayed it? Probably not so much the ones who were in the planes, because I had I imagine that they would be protected somewhat. I mean, kind of. So the the people in the planes, if they were handling it, they probably ended up with rashes from handling it. But if you're on the ground, the government theoretically did say that you're supposed to avoid a sprayed area for six months. But at no point did the army give any service people time to avoid the area for six months. Well, of course not. Why would we do that? Yeah, and so they would basically immediately go into the place that had been sprayed they would experience respiratory distress. It would hurt to breathe because they were breathing in the mist. They would get the rashes. They would be headachy and dizzy. They'd be oh, nauseous. Oh, that chloracne too. The chloracne. They could get okay. that, especially if they were in a puddle of it. I have a quote from a book called Waiting for an Army to Die, where a serviceman is quoted as saying that they were not given adequate time of six months. He actually says, six months, try six days, six minutes. Drank water and ate food sprayed with Agent Orange. Slept on ground soaked with that shit. Got sprayed directly, soaking wet. The government is lying. They can make up all the stories they want, but we know better. They weren't there. We were. Wow. That gave me chills. I, I don't imagine that they would have had a chance to nurse their symptoms. Mm -mm. I mean, because this guy's saying they weren't even given six minutes, let alone six right. days, six months. I'm imagining maybe not some of the more experienced, grizzled servicemen, like maybe my grandfather is like, I've been doing this shit for the last 20 years. <laughs> but like the younger soldiers, I mean, did they reach out to their higher ups and say, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing this. What is this about? I doubt it. I haven't read anything, but I doubt it because what I've seen is that these symptoms were just written off as combat fatigue or combat stress. 
Ugh. It's such a, an awful situation to be in in the first place. So you probably have a headache because you're around gunfire all the time. You right. probably have gastrointestinal distress because you might be coming down with malaria. You're drinking the water of the jungle and who knows what's in that. There's just so many other things happening at the time that I'm sure it was either written off by the higher ups or it was written off by the servicemen. And they were like, I just got to get through this. There's nothing that can be done. I want to just backtrack just slightly, but you were talking about, we don't really know with the different concentrations of what they were using, because domestically we knew to dilute it. Mm -hmm. But when we were using it overseas, that likely wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. Would I be correct in saying that that probably had something to do with the effects in the different areas because everything was just so haphazard with how much we're spraying, how there was no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that the concentration had a little bit to deal with it. And the concentration of dioxin and samples that they were able to test from the Vietnam War over the several years that we were there and the several batches of Agent Orange that we were using, the levels of dioxin varied wildly, but they were always higher than the permitted amount of dioxin for domestic samples of herbicides. And those herbicides even were actually banned in 1979 by the EPA for domestic use, and they still have lower levels of dioxin than what we were using in Vietnam. So the immediate effects sounds like they were incredibly devastating to the plant and animal life but not nearly as bad on people at first. So, not at first. Not at first. So the long-term effects are where it was felt hardest for the civilians and soldiers of Vietnam and the American soldiers. Mm -hmm. So can we go down that dark road and talk about the visceral, hard-to-hear effects of Agent Orange on the human body? Yeah, so there's only a couple diseases that are even now recognized as being associated with Agent Orange, but I'm sure the list is more extensive than this. Well, and this is because the government doesn't want to be culpable, right? Exactly, exactly. And I, I don't think that we've actually admitted to anything for the people of Vietnam. So this is pretty much exclusively for servicemen and not even the families of servicemen. This is just people who served in okay. Vietnam. So this is, these are the ones that they're willing to say, sure, it's suspected. Yes. Okay. Chronic B cell leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, prostate cancer, respiratory cancers, soft tissue sarcomas, ischemic heart disease, chloracne, porphyria cutanea tarda, Parkinson's disease, peripheral neuropathy, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and AL amyloidosis. So those are the 14 that the VA is, as of 2021, willing to recognize. So that's 14 diseases that they're willing to say are suspected. That's not counting how many are probable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot more that has been reported than just what they're willing to, to recognize. Okay, so th that's what we are willing to recognize for our U.S. servicemen what information, I don't care who it comes from, but what about the effects on the Vietnamese population, like the civilians and soldiers? So before Agent Orange defoliation in South Vietnam, liver cancer was the eighth most common form of cancer, accounting for 2.9% of all cancers. As of okay. 1979, liver cancer was the second most prevalent form of cancer, which accounted for 10% of all cancers in that <gasps> country. And this is compared to liver cancer rates in Hanoi, North Vietnam, which did not have direct spraying and did not have their cancer levels change significantly during that time. That's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And then I, I have another quote here from a North Vietnamese soldier who says that they fought in South Vietnam. Okay. So he, he says, for me, I have been infected directly with Agent Orange, poor eyesight, losing most of my lower jaw's teeth, two loose teeth, often getting ill, gastrectomy of three-fourths of my stomach, <gasps> gangrene of 40 centimeters of my intestine, rheumatic limbs, and neurothemia. He also says, in consequence of his infection with Agent Orange, he says, my wife has had three monsters in three pregnancies followed by three disabled children. One of them is congenitally amputated, one of them is disabled and deformed, and one of them has a disabled left leg and cannot move. Oh my god, what does congenitally deformed mean? Like they were deformed at birth? At birth, 
Yes. Okay. One of the most chilling effects of Agent Orange is that exposure to it may not necessarily damage the person who it was exposed to in a visible way or in a way that presents itself with cancer or with any of the things that we've named above. But people who were exposed tend to have children with birth defects if they can even have children. A lot of the South Vietnamese women who served, they just, they miscarry and they can't even have children. So it, wow. yeah, it has major impacts on the human reproductive system. Wow. Sorry, I'm just taking that in. That's mm -hmm. a lot. And the VA does now recognize veterans' children who have spina bifida, but they still only recognize a handful of diseases associated with the children of vets who served. Well, because that means that they're going to have to take responsibility, own that responsibility for even more people who have been harmed. I get why the government wants to hide it because it's fucking deplorable. It is. It is. I get why they want to hide it, but I don't, it's not okay because I would want to know if I were a child of a serviceman that I should try to get a jump start on some things with my health care, or these are potential things that we might have to look for mm -hmm. down the road. Suspending my, my frustration and resentment even more. So this was happening to the servicemen and women mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Was this also happening with the civilians? Were they also having children with these birth defects? Yeah, yeah, they definitely have. And so I've seen documentaries where it shows the people of South Vietnam or the people who were in South Vietnam and maybe have relocated. And it's kind of a, um, there's a social stigma against having a child with a birth defect. And so I saw this documentary where it showed how people are, are dealing with having children who are born with birth defects. And it's, of course, it's, it's a medical difficulty. It's, it's economic, it's, you know, financially straining on the family, but because of the stigma, some of them hide their children. Some people, their neighbors don't even know that they have a kid that has, they don't even know they have a kid because the kid has a birth defect. And so they're hiding them and keeping them tucked away. Yeah. Because the whole family will be kind of looked down on by the community. That's so sad. It's impacted servicemen and it's impacted the civilians. Can we talk about some of the birth defects? And let's just take, while we're talking about the the social stigma of having children who were Agent Orange mm -hmm. babies, like he called his children monsters. Yeah. He yeah. Like to, to call your own child a monster is next level shit. It might be some of that stigma where he feels stigmatized by having these children. But I mean, he's also angry. He's angry that he was infected yeah. and he's angry that his children have a lower quality of life. As he should be. Some of these birth defects, these really severe birth defects, include missing limbs and organs, which sometimes they don't survive birth as a result. Sometimes they have extra limbs. A lot of them have bowel diseases and GI issues, neuropathy, mental handicaps, spinal problems, cleft palate, fetal deformities in general, which like I said, sometimes they do not survive birth, and then microencephaly, hydrocephaly, blindness, and deafness. What is micro and hydroencephaly? I'm familiar with most of those, but what are what are those? Microencephaly is the condition where a baby is born with a smaller head than normal. That was one of the key characteristics of babies who were born infected with the Zika virus, if anybody can oh, remember that. Oh, I remember the Zika, yep. And yep. then hydrocephaly is, it means water on the brain. And so babies are born with excess water surrounding their brain. And because babies don't have fully formed heads, so they can be born. Right. Their skull's not hard yet. It's still a soft. Yeah. It can cause the head to actually swell. And sometimes the babies don't survive that either. But some, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do survive it. And then they just have like light bulb shaped heads, essentially, is how I've seen it described. Because of the social stigma on these children with these deformities and with these issues, if they survive, do we know, I mean, are the parents trying to get them health care? Because you're, I mean, you're describing that the parents don't even want the neighbors to know. I think they're getting them health care if they can, but I think some of these communities are so impoverished, either because of the way of life that they had before Agent Orange or because they were forced out of their villages during Agent because Orange, of Agent Orange, yeah, they, they just don't have the means, even if they wanted to, to help their children in the way that they would like. 
while we're talking about the children, I had posted a video on TikTok asking our friends if anybody had something that they wanted to bring up. Most of the questions that were posted, we've already kind of covered, but one that came up was somebody had heard that Agent Orange affects sperm count. Yes. I had heard you mention it. It talks about testicular cancer. Women miscarry from it. Mm -hmm. So it affects the men's sperm count. Do we know if that also affect any effects with the children as well? Or is that just the servicemen that were directly? No. So as I said before, there was an explosion at a laboratory in Italy in 1976, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they collected data from the people who were directly exposed. But then several years later, they collected data from the sons of the women who had been exposed and and breastfed their infants. The sperm motility of these young men, these 18-year-old men, was lower and the sperm count was lower. And so it is this generational issue. Wow. Do scientists and the medical community have any estimate on how long these effects are going to be felt for future generations? We've so far talked about the people who were directly affected, Mm -hmm. the U.S. Vietnamese soldiers and the civilians in South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about the children. Do we know about the children's children, the third generation yet? I think that the third generation in Vietnam is experiencing some of the impact of Agent Orange, but it's difficult to assess, I think, where the problem lies. So I don't think that they necessarily can draw a correlation between the dioxins stored in the fat of mothers and then the fat of daughters of mothers or anything like that, even though dioxin is stored in the fat and it's seen in blood samples drawn decades even after the fact, you know, after the exposure. But because of how long dioxins last in the soil and because there are some people who still have to live in those communities and drink the water and eat the plants that have taken up dioxins from the soil... I think that there are still people who are being exposed for the first time living in Vietnam. What the fuck? Yeah. Do the people of Vietnam in these areas that have been directly affected with the spray, do they do they know? I think they know. I just think that there's nothing that can be done. So in 2004, a group of Vietnamese citizens filed a class action lawsuit against more than 30 chemical companies, including the same ones that settled with U.S. veterans in 1984 for Agent Orange exposure. And the suit, which sought billions of dollars worth of damages, claimed that Agent Orange and its poisonous effects left a legacy of health problems and that its use constituted a violation of international law, which... Seems fair. They also said that half a million children had been born with serious birth (gasps) defects in Vietnam. What? And and two million more were suffering from cancer or other illness caused by Agent Orange. Unfortunately, in March of 2005, a federal judge in Brooklyn dismissed the suit. Oh my... Another U.S. court judge rejected a final appeal in 2008. Come on, guys. And Come on. the the same guy who wrote that book, Waiting for an Army to Die, his name is Fred Wilcox, and he said, The U.S. government refuses to compensate Vietnamese victims of chemical warfare because to do so would mean admitting that the U.S. committed war crimes in Vietnam. This would open the door to lawsuits that would cost the government billions of dollars. Who gives a fuck? I'm sorry. This whole thing, it's it's continuing because of profit, but it also started because of profit because Dow Chemical knew that there were dioxins, high amounts of dioxins in Agent Orange, and they first hid it from the government. And then when a memo was leaked in 1965, they tried to suppress the FDA. The Food and Drug Administration. Yes, the American Food and Drug Administration from doing anything about it. And so then the government had to hire a separate laboratory to test Agent Orange and prove that it was causing cancer in lab rats. And it was only after the release of that information to scientists nationwide in the United States who weren't directly involved with Agent Orange, and they're upset about it that we stopped using Agent Orange. But these things happened. So those memos got leaked in 1965. Operation Ranch Hand started in what, 61, 62? 62. Yeah. So three years into it, we've already used it. Mm -hmm. We've used millions of gallons of this herbicide. And then we find out, oh shit, this is some bad stuff. Well, I mean, Dow already knew. Uh, Dow and Monsanto knew, knew, yeah. So Dow and Monsanto knew. 
So I will give the U.S. government a little bit of slack, but I also think that it's, it was blissfully ignorant of them because it's the whole, well, I didn't know how bad this was. I didn't know. So I mean, can you be mad at me? I didn't know I was going to do that. I didn't know I couldn't do that. Which it's just <laughs> another list of things that it's like, you knew you couldn't do that. You knew it was a violation of right. the 1925 Geneva right. Protocol. Somebody knew. Somebody knew something. We always knew that we weren't doing the right thing, and yet we continued to do it anyhow. So we know it's bad. We know that there are people who are trying to get help for it. Finally, the government is willing to say, yeah, these things could have maybe happened. Mm -hmm. These issues are happening with the Vietnamese people. They attempted to sue. That was thrown out. Where are we at today? Do scientists and the medical community know how long these effects are going to be felt? I don't think we can know. I mean... There are some remediation attempts to clean up hot spots of dioxins, but I think it's mostly centered at Air Force bases. And so I don't, I don't know that there's a lot being done for people who are still living in those agrarian communities. And <sighs> the, the effects on the environment, I don't even know if that's ever going to be able to be reversed. I, I don't know how it can. I mean, when... How ecosystems work, if I remember intro to biology, I mean, everything feeds everything else. Mm -hmm. So the plants take up the water, the plants grow, then more water condensation happens. We have rain, then that goes back into the water. And so it's constantly this circle jerk of dioxin. Well, yeah, there's that, but then there's also just... The fact that, like I said, it's like the jungles had been affected by a fire, and anybody who lives anywhere that has been affected by fires, which is everywhere, because welcome to the 21st century, you know that like when the when the big plants die and they don't have root systems anymore, and there's heavy rains like there are in the jungle, it uh, causes an erosion uh, of the topsoil, and yeah. then nothing can grow there because all of the nutrients in the topsoil have been washed away. Washed away, and so. There's nothing that is able to grow there right now, and it could take a hundred years or more to restore anything even being able to grow. Fuck. And that is if the area isn't completely decimated by commercial logging endeavors, which is still happening. This is so problematic and scary <laughs> and sad. Okay, I have a couple of questions. I guess first question would be, is Agent Orange still being used anywhere today? I don't believe that we use 24D or 245T anywhere today, but I could be wrong because I did see some things that suggested that it's still used, mm -hmm. but I couldn't follow that to anywhere that verified that it's still used okay. in any way. I do know that there were some bans made by the EPA in 1979, and I don't okay. know if maybe they changed their composition in order to be used or not. So I don't mm. think that it is used in okay. the United States anyhow today. We now know how deadly and dangerous it is. Mm -hmm. If somebody were exposed to it today, is there an antidote or some kind of relief for the exposure? Or is it kind of, well, you're screwed? If Hopefully it would be a low enough concentration that it would have no impact, which is what most of the literature that I found has said, is that most people, when they're tested, they don't have elevated levels of dioxin. If people are, are exposed to 2,4-D, there are things that can be done for them for the 2,4-D exposure. In general, there's just not a whole lot that can be done. Like, once you're exposed to dioxin, you're exposed. And I don't even know what they did for Viktor Yushchenko to get him through. They probably, right. you know, just tried to help him get as much of it out of his system as he could, I guess. But it would still be stored in your in your fat. It's still just going to be there. But I don't imagine that... When they halted use of Agent Orange, that, oh, well, we used it all, so we don't have any of it left over. So what do we know about any of the remaining Agent Orange being stored? Yeah, so uh, there was actually an operation for the storage and transport of Agent Orange in 1971, it was called Operation Pacer Ivy, and so they actually collected all of the barrels that they were able to locate, and they collected them in Korea for some reason. So there's a demilitarized zone in Korea that's a hot spot for Agent Orange. They relabeled the barrels, re-drummed them, and then shipped them to Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean for storage. <sighs> 
However, there are other places that it has been stored. So Agent Orange was stored at 21 different military bases worldwide, including Cambodia, India, Laos, Thailand, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Canada, in <sighs> addition to Korea and the Johnston Island at sea. Other than Hawaii and Puerto Rico... I didn't hear anything about the mainland United States storing any of this. Yeah, why would we store it here? Ah, yeah, of course not. No, because we don't want to shit where we eat. Yeah, exactly. Ugh, okay. I guess my final question is, are there other examples of Agent Orange being used in warfare? Because we went in detail with Vietnam, but were there other people who saw what we were doing or they had the idea first? Yes. So there was a mercenary in South Africa who claimed that during the Angola War against Portugal for independence between 1970 and 1973 that a superior brought him a barrel and told him to mix this barrel, what was in it, with 2,4-D. And he said that the chemical agents acted very quickly on the cassava leaves and on branches and on sweet potatoes, causing them to become completely dry in less than two days. The toxic poisons were also attested to by the badly burnt trees in the forest, which looked as they had been, suffered a violent fire. Soon the cassava, roots, and sweet potatoes became soft and mushy. They turned black as if they had all been soaked in bad water for several days. The mm. result was total destruction of all crops affected. So, Agent Orange has been used in Africa for the same purpose. And, right. <laughs> of course, in the 1970s, there were some activists in the United States that were saying that this was another form of massacre and it was genocidal. And it could be that they just didn't know what was happening in Vietnam and that they would have thought the same thing. But, right. again, we considered this to be a massacre and that it was genocidal. And yet our government was doing it in The Vietnam. exact same thing. Yeah. <sighs> See, and that's one of those things where it's, we can't have an educated opinion if we don't have all of the information. Yeah. And we didn't know about this. I, this is crazy. Let's bring it back to Vietnam to tie everything up. After Agent Orange was halted, mm -hmm. the war didn't end. What did we do? Did so, we just stop the defoliant no. plan of attack? Oh. No. no, we just stopped using Agent Orange because Agent Orange is part of a spectrum of herbicides called rainbow herbicides. And so Agent Orange wasn't even the first one that we used. We didn't start using Agent Orange until 1965. Prior to that, we were using Agents Green, Pink, Purple, and Blue. And then after Agent Orange was discontinued, we started using Agent White. Wow. So, lots of colors in this destructive spectrum. Agents green, pink, and purple were different ratios of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Mm. However, mm -hmm. for next episode, because this one is getting a little long, we're yeah. going to cover agents blue and white, which agent blue contained no dioxin, but it was an arsenical herbicide, and oh. agent white contained an herbicide called pechlorum, which was contaminated by hexachlorobenzene and nitroamines. Thank you for researching this one for me because it's something that I have wanted to know more about for, again, over a decade now. And I was so intimidated by all of the information about it. And it was really hard to get through, you mm -hmm. know, because it is such a sad story. It was intense to research. I, I hope that people are interested enough to listen to the next episode because I don't feel like systemic issues and acts of warfare are necessarily my forte. So I really wanted to do the whole story justice. You know, I, d I don't want right. to necessarily blame service people because, again, if people aren't familiar with everything surrounding the Vietnam War, we had a draft. And so as not keen on the military as I am, there were people who were there and they did not want to be. Yeah, gosh, we didn't even touch on that. A lot of people did not want to serve. That's why there are people who were draft dodgers. And there were people at universities who were actively trying to get the government to stop. They were protesting it. There mm -hmm. were people who were protesting the use of herbicides here that I'm sure would have protested the use of herbicides there if we had known about it. And it's, it's also worth mentioning that the draft disproportionately drafted Black Americans and Americans of other minority status, and it was Black Americans and Americans of other minority status who were killed disproportionately as a result of this war. And I don't think that that's touched on a lot. And so there's just a lot 
it is sensitive. There's a lot of sensitivity surrounding this. And I just want to give a lot of, I want to give a lot of credit to those points of view. I don't want to over sympathize with soldiers because they were there making offensive maneuvers against people in a foreign country. And I also want to recognize the difficulties that the civilians faced and are still facing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so hard because, I mean, what do you do when you're Dratton and you said you have to go to war for your country? Here's this gun in your hand and you don't want to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of them were really young men, you know, 18 year olds it, who were being drafted and they didn't know any better. They didn't know what they were doing. They were just fighting for their country. They, yeah. And I mean, and even the ones who were for it were like, I'm going to do this great thing for my country. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know the gravity of the mm -hmm. effects of them walking around with a tank on their back to spray this chemical that they thought was going to help. Yeah, they thought it was going to kill mosquitoes and stop yeah. malaria. In my opinion, for the close of this episode, I think that the real people to be angry with are Dow Chemicals and Monsanto yeah. to me. And then next in line that I'm going to be pissed off at <laughs> is the U.S. government. Yeah. The higher ups that made these decisions, you know, yeah. like you said, I don't want to over sympathize with people who were killing children, killing women, killing, you know, yeah. some them, but some of them didn't have a choice. The government had a choice. For Dow sure. Chemicals and Monsanto had a choice. Well, thank you again for all of the information. I'm looking forward to learning about the other colors of the rainbow de la destruction. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe, and remember, the dose makes the poison.